All right, now let's take what we've learned about cations and anions and put them together and start naming ionic compounds. All right, so the first thing I want to say here, uh, I didn't actually put this in the uh, text of the slide, but I want to emphasize that the reason we're doing this, we've been talking about nomenclature for a while, and nomenclature, of course, is, is naming things. Um, and it is important to name things properly, but I want you to understand that the reason that we're doing this is not just about names. The reason that we're doing this is part of being able to name something like sodium sulfate. The reason we work on names is because it's important when you see something like this that it doesn't just look like a collection of sodiums and sulfurs and oxygens and that when you see this you say okay i see what that is that's an ionic compound and it's got two parts it's got a sulfate which has a charge of two minus and then stuck on that or associated with it or electrostatically attracted to it whatever you want to say are a couple of sodiums right and so being able to name this correctly as sodium sulfate is important to understanding what this actually is and what this actually is is a compound with two distinct parts to it it's got a sulfate which is SO4 with a two minus charge. And then it has two sodiums attracted to it, um, kind of added to it with an electrostatic attraction between the positive charge on the sodiums and the negative charge on the uh, sulfate ions. Right? And the, the sulfates and the sodiums are gonna behave somewhat independently. So if you take sodium sulfate and you dissolve it in water, it's gonna behave as if it's a solution containing sodium ions and sulfate ions, right? So the behavior of that solution depends on the things that the ionic compound is made of. And so it's important to be able to look at a, a, a compound and recognize the different parts and understand that the behavior is gonna be dependent on the behavior of those different parts. All right, so now you know, going back to the uh, nomenclature, there are really two rules uh, and the rules are really simple, and that is that when we name ionic compounds, we just name the cation and then the anion, All right? So for example, sodium chloride, we've got sodium cations and chloride anions. And so the name of that compound is just sodium chloride you name the cation and then you name the anion right so that's why we've been working on independently on learning how to name cations and anions the second rule is that when you put the compound together you have to construct it so that the net charge is zero right and that means that the total positive charge is equal to the total negative charge so when you add all the cations and anions together the net charge is zero those are really the only two things that you have to know in addition to being able to name the cations and the anions independently. Those are really the only two things you need to know, uh, but they do take a little bit of practice. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, try some of these. We'll go through a couple where we start with names and get formulas, and then we'll do some where we go the other way around. All right. So let's see how we can use this to um, write formulas for ionic compounds based on their names. And we'll start with sodium chloride. <clears throat> sodium, there's no um, number here in Roman numerals, nothing to tell us the charge on the sodium. But because sodium is in group one, we know that sodium has a plus one charge. And for chloride, this IDE suffix here 
tells us that it is a simple anion. So it's not an oxy anion. There's no oxygens on it. It's just uh, Cl. And if you look at the periodic table, you'll see that chlorine has one fewer electrons than argon. So chlorine, when it forms an ion, it'll add one electron to form chloride. And since the charge on sodium is plus one and chloride is minus one, we can just combine them together with one sodium and one chloride. And so our formula is just NaCl. All right, now let's look at magnesium bromide. Magnesium, again, there's no Roman numeral here, but magnesium is in group two. And so we know that magnesium has a two plus charge and bromide because it ends with IDE we know that it's a simple anion so it's just BR and by looking at the periodic table we can see that bromide has a charge of minus one so now we can't combine these together the same way we did with sodium chloride because the charges aren't balanced so I'm going to make a little table here and this is it's really simple you probably don't need to make a table in most cases but again, I want to go through the systematic approach because it might be helpful when you get to some that are more complicated. So we want to find a way to combine these so the positive charge and the negative charges cancel out. So if we look at the magnesium, one magnesium would give us a charge of plus two. Two magnesiums would give us a charge of plus four. Three magnesiums would give us a charge of plus six four would give us a charge of plus eight and so on and so forth for the bromides one bromide would give us a charge of negative one two bromides a charge of minus two three bromides a charge of minus three and four a charge of minus four and so on and so forth so we see that we can combine them if we have one magnesium we get a charge of plus two and two bromides we get a charge of minus two so in order to combine these so that the charges are balanced we need one magnesium and two bromides and so we would write the formula mg br2 meaning that the uh, the compound contains two bromides for every one magnesium All right, now let's look at um, ammonium sulfate. Ammonium is one of those uh, polyatomic cations that we learned. All right. Ammonium is a charge NH4, or excuse me, formula NH4 and a charge of plus one. Sulfate is one of the oxy anions that we remembered, and that's SO4, 2 minus. Again, we can't combine them with just one of each because the charges aren't balanced. So we'll make this little table. And one ammonium would give us a charge of plus one, two ammoniums, a charge of plus two, three ammoniums, a charge of plus three. Four charge of plus four, so on and so forth. Uh, for sulfates, one sulfate gives us a charge of minus two. Two gives us a charge of minus four. Three would be minus six. Four would be minus eight, and so on and so forth. And so the way we have to combine them together so that the charges balance is to have two ammoniums and one sulfate. And when we go to write the formula, we can't do exactly the same thing that we did for magnesium bromide. For magnesium bromide, to indicate that there were two bromides, we just put a two down there as a subscript. We can't do that here with ammonium because if we do that, it looks like NH42. So anytime we want to indicate 
that we have more than one of a polyatomic ion. What we do is put the ion in parentheses and then put the subscript outside the parentheses. So if we write it this way, this means that we've got two ammoniums and one sulfate. And that is the correct formula for ammonium sulfate. All right, now let's look at iron three oxide. Now for iron, uh, iron is a transition metal, so it can have multiple different charges, right? But because we've got this D in parentheses here, we know that in this particular case, this is an iron three ion with a charge of plus three, right? For the oxide, this IDE suffix tells us that this is a simple anion so it's just an oxygen with a negative charge and if we look at the periodic table we see that oxygen is two spaces away from neon so when oxygen forms an anion it's going to acquire two electrons to have a charge of negative two okay. so if we want to combine these two right we look at the possible positive and negative charges. Um, one iron gives us a charge of plus three. Two irons, plus six, plus nine for three, and plus 12 for four. And for oxygen, one oxygen is minus two. Two oxygens minus four. Three oxygens minus six. Four oxygens minus eight. So if we want to combine these together so that the charges balance, we need two irons and three oxygens. And so we'd write this this way. Okay. Um, wonderful. Okay, I want to mention something also at this point. Uh, sometimes people tell me that they learned in school uh, that when they're writing these formulas just to take this number and put it over here and take this number and put it over here uh, that works about 80 percent of the time and you can see that, that would have worked here for the iron uh, iron three oxide but that doesn't always work um, so please don't do this uh, please don't do this little thing where you just swap the numbers around um, Please think about what you're doing, and even if you don't write everything out, you don't have to write it out explicitly, but at least in your head, please think through them this way, because this is really uh, what's important. So you want to make sure that you've got the charges balanced out, uh, and don't just do this little uh, algorithm here. It's not always correct. All right, and our last one is zinc cyanide. Zinc is a transition metal. Right. Um, and we don't have anything here to tell us the charge. That would be disconcerting, except that zinc is one of those four special cases that we've memorized. So we know that zinc is always a plus two ion, and cyanide is a polyatomic ion that we've memorized, and that's Cn minus one. So if we want to combine these together, I'm going to go through this a little bit more quickly because I think we've got this. Okay. So if we want to balance the charges, uh, we see that with one zinc and two cyanides, we can get a positive charge of plus two and a negative charge of minus two. So zinc, cyanide, and as before with the ammonium, we don't want to just put a two here because that looks like CN2, like it's one carbon and two nitrogens, right? So for any polyatomic ion, we'll put this in parentheses, and we'll put the two down there. And that's the correct formula for zinc cyanide. Here's uh, some more of these. Um, 
I'm not going to work through them in as much detail as I did last time. Um, what I'd like you to do is hit the pause button, uh, see if you can write formulas for all of these, and then when you're done, unpause. Uh, looks like these are actually a little bit tougher than the ones on the last page, now that I look at them. Um, but give them a shot. Uh, try to write formulas for these, and then unpause, and take a look at uh, what I've got and see if we got the same thing. All right, for the first one, nickel chloride. Nickel is a transition metal, um, and because we've got the two here, we know that it's uh, plus two. Chloride, again, it's just a simple anion with a negative one charge. Um, so you can make that table, and if you make the table, you'll see that you need two chlorides for every one nickel. And so the formula for nickel two chloride is NiCl2. Ammonium acetate. Ammonium is polyatomic cation, NH4+. Acetate, polyatomic anion, C2H3O2-. minus. And since this one is plus one and this one is minus one, we can combine them just as they are. This one's going to look a little bit odd. Um, there's our formula for ammonium acetate. And this underscores what I've been saying about the need to memorize all of those um, cations and anions, especially the anions, but the cations as well. Uh, because if you didn't, if you weren't really familiar with them, this would just look like a long string of letters, just some crazy combination of nitrogen and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. And you're like, what in the heck is that? Uh, so it's really important to have all of those memorized so that when you see that, you just look at it and instantly say, okay, I see what that is. There's an ammonium over here and there's an acetate over there. This is ammonium acetate, right? It's important that when you look at it, you can immediately see the different parts instead of just seeing one big jumble of letters. All right, lithium hydrogen sulfate. Uh, lithium uh, is a group one ion, so that's going to be Li+. Plus. Hydrogen sulfate, this is a compound ion. Sulfate is SO4, 2 minus. So hydrogen sulfate is HSO4, 1 minus. And so this is plus 1, this is minus 1. We can combine them just as they are. LiH SO4, lithium hydrogen sulfate. All right. uh, silver phosphate. Silver is a transition metal, and they didn't give us <clears throat> they didn't give us a um, charge in parentheses here, but silver is one of those special cases. Right. Silver is always plus one, so we don't need an, uh, a Roman numeral there. And then phosphate is one of the polyatomic anions that we've memorized, PO43 minus. So if we're combining these, you can make that little table again. When you make the table, you'll see that you're going to need three of these and one of those. And so the formula, the AG3PO4. All right, and our last one, magnesium bromite. A couple parts to this one. Uh, magnesium is just a group two cation because magnesium is in group two you know that it's plus two bromite we might not know that one right offhand but we know that bromate is bro3 and this ite suffix means that we've moved down one step in that oxy anion table right so if bromate is bro3 Bromite is BrO2, again with the same charge of minus 1. Right. So magnesium is plus 2, bromite is minus 1, and we can make ourselves that little table. If we do that, we'll see that we need uh, 1 magnesium for a charge of plus 2, 
and two bromites for a charge of minus two. And so magnesium, bromite, and again, for polyatomic ions, if we want to indicate more than one of them, we we'll use parentheses. We'll write it like that. So that's magnesium bromite. All right, now let's look at going the other direction using formulas and determining the names. In this first one, uh, again, we've got a nickel here, a nickel ion, and we've got this oxy anion. Uh, so our cation is going to be nickel. This oxy anion, BrO3, is one of the ones that we memorized. So that's bromate. Okay. But because nickel is a transition metal, we have to indicate the charge on the nickel ion here. We can't just call it nickel bromate. We've got to call it nickel 1 bromate or nickel 2 bromate or nickel 3 bromate, whatever that charge is. So in order to figure out the charge in the cation, we need to know what the charge is on the anion. And then we do basically uh, the same thing we did uh, on the previous slides. We just do that same thing backward, right? Okay. So uh, our, we know that the molecule has to be composed so that the positive and negative charges are equal, right? And bromate has a charge of minus one. So that means that the total negative charge is two, because there are two of them here. 2 times minus 1, which is negative 2. That means the total positive charge here has to be plus 2. Right? And if we've only got one nickel and the charge is plus 2, then the charge on that nickel ion has to be plus 2. Right? So this would be nickel 2 bromate. All right. Now we've got a uh, cobalt compound. Right. Cobalt, and our anion here is hydroxide. I often, when I'm writing these, I often capitalize uh, the anion. It's okay if you do that, but technically, um, it's it's not supposed to be that way. Uh, but I'm just kind of I'm writing things like as if they're titles, where I'm just kind of capitalizing everything. Um, normally, uh, yeah, normally that should really be written like that. Uh, I just kind of like the capitals. I apologize for that. It's non-standard. <clears throat> okay. So going back to the cobalt hydroxide, um, the cation is cobalt, <clears throat> the anion is hydroxide, so the name is cobalt hydroxide. But because cobalt is a transition metal, again, just like last time, we have to include that charge in there. So we'll make a little table. Uh, according to the formula, we've got one cobalt and two hydroxides. Hydroxide has a charge, let me put a question mark there. Hydroxide's got a charge of minus one, and there are two of them. So the total negative charge is minus two. That means the total positive charge has got to be plus two. And if we've only got one cobalt and the total charge is plus two, the cobalt must be a Must be a cobalt 2 plus ion. So we call this cobalt 2 hydroxide. All right, and the next one, we've got sodium. And then we've got something that looks a little bit complicated. Right. Here's our cation. And then we have a compound uh, ion here for the anion. Right. Uh, remember. 
that CO3 2 minus is carbonate. So if we add one hydrogen to it, uh, the charge increases by one, so it goes from negative two to minus one. So this HCO3 is a hydrogen carbonate ion. So if we want to write the name for this, we'll write the cation. Which is sodium. And the anion. Then here, uh, do we need to include the charge on the sodium? In this case, we don't because sodium is in group one. So sodium is always going to be, uh, sodium is always gonna be plus one. So we don't need to include that charge there. In fact, we shouldn't include the charge. It would look really weird if we did. All right. Okay, uh, the next one, we have uh, an iron here. And they've got this big collection of things over here, right? If you are good at your uh, anions, if you've memorized them, you'll recognize this over here as an acetate ion. So our cation is an iron of some type. And our anion is acetate. And if we make a little table we have a lot of room for a table here. Our iron, don't know what the charge is, we'll call it plus question mark. And our acetate, that. Uh, acetate has a charge of minus one. And we have two of them. So our total anion charge is negative two. Total cation charge is plus two. And since we only have one iron, it must be an iron two ion. So we would write it like that. Okay. All right, and our last one, we've got aluminum and oxygen. And the oxygen here, this is not a polyatomic ion. It's just three simple ions, three oxides. All right, so we've got aluminum oxide. And we can check the table. We really don't need to in this case because aluminum is one of those special metals that always has the same charge. Aluminum is always three plus and oxide is two minus. So our total positive charge here is gonna be two times plus three, which is plus six. And our negative side is gonna be three times minus two, which is minus six, All right? So we've got two aluminums for plus six, three oxides for minus six, and all of that balances out, All right? But in this case, we don't need to include the charge for oxygen in Roman numerals because oxygen is one of those uh, special cases. So we'll just name that aluminum oxide. All right, uh, I've got a couple on the next page for you. And let's see. All right, so go ahead and uh, hit pause and work through these, see if you can get the names and then unpause and we'll look at them together. Okay, so the first one, we've got two parts. Our cation is a potassium. Our anion is NO2. And you should remember that NO3 is nitrate.
And if NO3 is nitrate, you remove one oxygen, that means we're going down one step in that oxyanion table. So that becomes nitrite. Right? So our cation is potassium and our anion is nitrite. And because potassium is in group one, we don't need to include the charge in the name. So we can just simply call this potassium nitrite. Okay. The next one we've got uh, chromium for our cation and sulfate for our anion. Our name would be chromium sulfate, okay. but chromium is a transition metal, so we need to include the charge here. So I'll make a little table, chromium plus question mark, we don't know if the charge is on the chromium, and sulfate is a charge of two minus. So for our anion, we've got three sulfates. So uh, the total negative charge is minus six. That means the uh, chromium has to have a charge of plus six. And if we look at the, the formula here, there are two chromiums. So two times whatever that charge is on chromium equals plus six. And that means chromium has got to be plus three. Okay. So if chromium has a charge of plus three, then we want to name this as chromium 3 sulfate. All right. Our next one, our cation here is calcium. Our anion is a compound ion. I think we might have had that one on the last page, right? The cation, calcium, and this compound ion is hydrogen carbonate. And because calcium is in group two, it's always always has a charge of plus two. That means we don't need to include the charge here. So we can just name this calcium hydrogen carbonate. And if you want to run the numbers and put them in the table, you'll see calcium is plus two, hydrogen carbonate is minus one. And so that's why we need two hydrogen carbonates for each calcium. All right, our next one, we've got uh, cation is silver. Our anion is this guy over here. Uh, ClO4 is not one of the ones that we memorized, but we memorized that ClO3 is chlorate, and so that means if we go up one in that table, add an oxygen, then we get perchlorate, right? So our cation is silver and our anion is perchlorate. And even though silver is a transition metal, Right. Silver is one of those special case um, elements. Uh, the charge on silver is always plus one, so we don't need to include the charge here. We don't need Roman numerals. We'll just call it silver perchlorate. All right, and then this last one, again, looks like a big jumble of letters. In fact, I think we just did this one. Uh, 
that's okay. Um, uh, if we look at this, we need to be able to identify the cation and the anion from this jumbly mess. And we see this part on the left, NH4, that is an ammonium ion. And on the right, C2H3O2 is an acetate ion. So that would be ammonium acetate. All right, lovely. All right, so we looked at naming ionic compounds and two simple rules, really. Uh, one is that the name is just name the cation and then name the anion. Uh, the only tricky part is you need to name them carefully, right? You need to be able to recognize cations and anions, uh, including all of the polyatomic ones and all of the uh, variants of the oxy anions. And very importantly, you need to remember if your cation is a transition metal, then you need to include that charge in the name. That's part of the name of that cation. Okay, that's an iron two cation, not just an iron cation. All right, so that's the first thing: naming the um, cation and the anion, and that you have to construct them such such that the net charge is zero. Uh, that's really important. It's really important going both ways, whether you're writing the formula or whether you're determining the name, because sometimes knowing that the charge, the net charge is zero, is part of doing the math to figure out what the charge on that transition metal ion was in the first place. All right, so that's important. And you might, you might make a little table like this to figure out how to combine the cations and the anions so that everything balances out. Uh, once you get comfortable enough with it uh, that you feel like you can skip that or do that in your head, that's fine. Um, but I think it's uh, often useful to go ahead and do that and work through it systematically um, as you're, you're first working on these. And then we use those rules to uh, determine the formulas of ionic compounds based on the name and going the other direction, figuring out the name of ionic compounds based on the formula. And it's important to be able to do both of those to be able to go in either direction. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, I'll remind you, uh, the whole point of this is so that uh, if you have something like that, it doesn't look like a big jumble of letters that when you see that, you'll immediately say, okay, I recognize that that compound is ammonium sulfate. It's composed of ammonium ions and sulfate ions, and the behavior of that compound is going to be um, basically based on the behavior of ammonium and sulfate. Those are the two parts that make up that compound. All right, lovely. Uh, this is really important stuff. I know it seems kind of trivial just naming things, uh, but it, it is really, really, really important. Um, I found in the past that if I give a, a long final exam, and part of that is nomenclature. Uh, students' grades on the entire exam often correlate very well with their um, with their scores on the nomenclature section. I think more so than any other section. Uh, and I think the reason for that is well, the reason for that is you know this thing right here, right? Uh, if you can do well in nomenclature, then you can recognize what things are based on the names, right? Um, we talked early in the semester about um, understanding how microscopic properties relate to macroscopic properties. This is the same kind of thing, but now we're looking at how um, the symbolic representations relate to the microscopic representations. And then, of course, how the microscopic re representations relate to the macroscopic representations. Right. So it's really important that these uh, names aren't just a collection of letters, but they really mean something to you. That's really going to help you in the course, I believe. All right. Fantastic. Uh, work on those, and then we'll be back. We've got two more bits of nomenclature. Uh, both are a little bit shorter. Uh, one on nomenclature of acids, and one on um, very basic organic nomenclature. So we'll be back with those in a little bit.